Welcome back to the Courage to Grow show with Jeff and Joe. I am Jeff, joined as always by my my buddy, my co-host, Joe Marcou. Joe, how you doing, man? I'm not at the cabin, and that's okay. Great to be here. I'm stoked to speak to our guest. This is what it's all about. Yeah, absolutely. We have an awesome guest today who's going to enlighten us on the world of dentist appliances. You might be scratching your head right now and going, okay, what does this have to do with this show and everything that we've talked about? Well, it turns out that you can sell these high ticket appliances, which can absolutely change lives in the way of sleep, sleep apnea. So there's uh, something I never heard of before that I encountered thanks to the dojo after I met this guy and a few others from a pretty awesome program of dentists. And what they're doing is kind of reshaping the uh, the environment around sleep apnea, which is really cool. It's something that's you know, I'll let him explain it a little bit more, but it's much better than what you would think of as like a CPAP machine. Uh, sleep apnea is a serious issue that a lot of people deal with. And uh, what these guys are doing is they're trying to, you know, enter the market in a different way and make these these people's lives a lot more livable, a lot more enjoyable than dealing with, uh, you know, constant pumping and worrying of whatever that CPAP machine really does all night long. Uh, so spouses and partners you rejoice across the country. Uh, let's introduce them, though, without any further ado. Ben Sutter. How you doing, man? Hey, Jeff. Hey, Joe. Good to be with you guys. Doing great. Thanks. Thanks for being yeah. here. Absolutely. Thanks for the time. So, you know, I, obviously I crushed it and I explained exactly what you do to a T. Uh, but if you would so kindly, maybe you could improve upon what I said. Tell us in like 15 seconds or less, what is it that you do and what you sell? You know, for 15 or seconds or less, I don't know if we can we can really do it justice, but do it my best. So I do the physician outreach and also I run the direct to consumer outreach for Sleep Better Austin, which as you said, yes, we do oral appliances and there is so much that we could get into in what you just talked about there. So yeah, a lot of good stuff. Awesome. I mean, within the time limit so far, Joe, we're still 100% on this show. Everybody has gotten it in the time limit, right? I think Ben <laughs> just did it the fastest. That was like six seconds. Uh, but as he said, he, you know, you can't really do it justice in that amount of time. So talk to me about these these appliances. Give me an idea maybe of uh, I know you work with insurance as well. But when we're talking about sales, which is what this this podcast like core value is, is selling uh, and helping people do so in a better way and create buying conversations, build relationships over time, all of which we'll get into uh, in detail here today with maybe some examples from your own experience. But when we're talking about these devices, right, you, you mentioned just sleep devices or oral appliances, right? Um, what are we talking about there? Like, what does that look like? And what's the general ticket, the cost minus don't worry about insurance, I understand they can help out as well. But what are you looking at with that? Yeah. Okay. So good question. So to answer the first part, what is an oral appliance or an oral device? We've actually tried uh, our best to change the verbiage around that to oral device because mm -hmm. appliance to us sounds like your, your dishwasher. Yeah. <laughs> or, agree. or maybe, you know, so yeah, maybe your, your laundry machine. So we're trying yeah. to change that to oral device, but unfortunately, I mean, that's a thing that's going to take a long, long time because all the medical literature, sure. everybody has in its world of a oral appliance, right? Yep. So, but what an oral device or appliance, whatever you want to use is, it, it is a, essentially looks like an Invisalign that you pop into your mouth just while you sleep. So mm. it's an incredibly simple idea. And the idea is that you, you move the jaw forward. And by doing that while you sleep, you keep your tongue off the back of your throat, which for many people is what's causing their apnea, not all, but for many. And so that is a, is a much simpler way to treat the sleep apnea than a, a CPAP machine or a surgery or something like that. So it's right. kind of simple. Uh, does that kind of give you all a good overview of what we're talking about? Yeah. I mean, for us, 100%. I think for any of the listeners, for sure. Like it's uh, Invisalign to stop you from uh, suffocating at night, <laughs> right? essentially. There you go. <laughs> your, your inner marketer came out there, Jeff, and you just so put it real succinctly. Here's the thing, Ben. I know a little bit about your background. You're not a dentist. You work with a dentist. What's the connection? Yeah, so I, I am lucky enough to work with uh, one of the best dentists 
uh, dental groups that does this in the country. And by best, I mean like in terms of number of people who are doing it and really are focused on it. So there's many, many really fantastic dentists in the country that do this. Mm. I just am lucky that I work with uh, Dr. Brandon Hedgecock and Dr. Max Kerr, and they believe that we need to have physician outreach, which is somewhat unique in the space. There's not a lot of people that believe, oh, I need to have a marketing and sales person on my team. And so that's what I do. I do marketing and sales both in the B2B area as I'm going to doctors and also in the B2C area where I'm trying to develop pipeline and direct to consumer ways that uh, people can come and connect with us without going through their doctor. And really the point to that is or really what Jeff spoke, uh, touched on earlier is like, I wasn't really aware of these. So you got to know me and the, the other you know, people in our group. And that's a problem. You know, that is a problem because sleep apnea also, as you mentioned, I know that sleep apnea is not the focus of this podcast and I won't go too deep on it. But the reality is that our jaws over the last couple hundred years are actually getting smaller. And so when I was maybe in my 20s, I thought, well, people I knew a couple of people with sleep apnea. They were unfortunately, they were just a little overweight. You know, they were older, 50s and 60s. And I'm like, OK, well, that's not something I got to worry about I'm in my 20s. I'm in good shape. You know, but at the same time, here's a really interesting story. I would have dreams at night and, you know, my fiance would tell you this. There, there would be times when I'm making noises in my sleep and, and shaking like this. And I'm having dreams that I'm choking and I, I can't wake up. And I just thought it's like these weird nightmares I have sometimes. Yeah. Then I got to work for this company. I'm, I'm getting into it. I am li- reading the literature. And I'm like, you know what? Some of this kind of me. And again, I'm young. Uh, I'm in good shape. So I'm, I kind of like, but I eventually get a sleep test. So I find out I have stage two sleep apnea <laughs> and I had no idea. And I have none of the risk factors, you know? Yeah. So the reality is my jaw is just not big enough for my tongue. And there's a ton of people out there like that. And when I mean by that is a large percentage of the population. And there's so many books that document this. If you look at uh, the, the book breath of, uh, New York Times bestseller by James Nestor, the book Jaws, written by a couple of dentists, is really fantastic. Uh, the book Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker, I hope I have his name right, who is a sleep researcher. And there's more, but and there's so much it. literature out there showing for sure, like our jaws are getting small. And so, so you're well versed here, Ben. Like this, wow. this, is, uh, this is crazy. So my question to you is real quick, uh, out, of, out of the 340 million Americans, how many people in based on the research have sleep apnea and the real question is so how many people have it how many people don't know it so this is what the numbers suggest that over 25 percent of the population in the western world has sleep apnea enough to the point where it needs to be treated but less than five percent of that know it or have it treated less than five percent that's so what i mean yeah, that's the whole thing. What Jeff was talking about is the awareness and the willingness to to do something about it and realize, like, oh, it's not my fault. You know, like, yeah, I might have sleep apnea and I'm 24. It's me. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It, it's like a lot of things in health. There's just so many things in the modern world that have changed how the human body right. reacts, and we all just gonna have to accept the fact that a healthy life in the next 10 to 20 years is an augmented life in so many different ways, and it's well, just it, just the reality. Yeah, here, here's how this definitely ties down to sales. So anybody who hopped on the podcast and is like, all right, enough about dentistry, <laughs> enough about appliances. <laughs> I don't sell those. I hear you. The reason Ben's on the show is is very specific. Obviously, everybody who uh, sells anything has experienced failure and learned from it. We're going to talk about, you know, hopefully, if, if you're open to sharing some of your failures and mistakes that you've learned from, we'll get to those in a second. Here's the connection that I just tied up that I need everybody to really understand. And that is what you just said about awareness and willingness. So if we think about your population of of your ideal client, those with sleep apnea or symptoms of sleep apnea that are either in need right now or soon to be in need, this applies to everything that's ever been sold on the planet Earth. And I'm willing to die on that hill. Like there is an awareness to either a problem that you have, symptoms that you're experiencing. Uh, I mean, if we go to fitness, for example, like how many clients or potential clients of a personal trainer are actually aware of the specific issues that they're dealing with? 
all they feel like is I'm a bit overweight. But they don't know the specifics of it. They don't know if they're actually in any medical danger. If you go to the doctor, your doctor's going to look at you and they're going to say, well, they're not dying. Hey, you're looking great. You get that like thumbs up, good bill of health. And that's not digging into the nitty gritty. The only way you can really do that is with like blood tests, right? And and really uh, going to the labs and trying to figure out everything that's going on in your body. And 99.9% of people repeating is not going to do that. They're not going to do that. So when it comes to uh, our, our clients as coaches, as business owners, we have to recognize that a vast majority of our ideal clients don't know that they need us. And they can't know that they need us until we bring awareness to them. And then the willingness comes into play when we actually get a chance to speak with them. So they, they see our content. They uh, talk to us on the phone. They do a full-on discovery call. We, we do a Zoom call. We meet up in person, whatever it is. Now it comes down to how willing are they to are going to be to work with us. And a lot of that comes down to relationships and trust. So this all like ties together with what anybody who you know, is watching this or could be watching this uh, or listening to this is experiencing. Like we all have this, this like, here's your population, here's your avatar client. And a few of them, very few of them are like, hey, please help me. The vast majority are like, what are you talking about? Why would I need you? Why do I need this appliance? But as you're talking, like this is just connecting for me. So I appreciate that uh, being on the podcast today, man. Um, so let's get into a little bit of failure as we like to. It's the courage to grow. The, uh, and that courage really comes through when you make a mistake when something blows up in your face, when something doesn't work out and you and you just rejig it, you come back, you do it again, you try something different and you have that courage to persevere. So would you mind sharing like a story as it relates to, uh, you know, your current career path and, and selling with it? any mistakes that you've made, dealt with failures, et cetera, and how you've learned from that? Yeah, I have made more mistakes than I could probably count, man. Uh, this one's been a lot because... The interesting thing is my background is not medical at all. I actually owned restaurants before I did this. I, I wow. owned a small restaurant group. Yeah, so it was a huge change. And with huge change comes a lot of failure. And I think the sales industry is interesting in the fact that I am not the only one that has decided to switch from something else a little bit later on in life and try to give them, you know, sales a shot. So this might resonate with other people out there too. So I came from restaurants and um, I had never really tried to speak with a doctor in this way before. And, you know, if you've ever talked with a doctor on a, a non one on one, as in not in a, an appointment, they can be very intimidating people. They're mm -hmm. straight to the point. They don't have a lot of time. They want a lot of data. And I'm, I know I'm using uh, broad strokes here, but uh <laughs> said a lot of things in the moment that I wish I could take back <laughs> for sure. So yeah. one time I remember I was in uh, I was in a meeting. And so what happens is a lot of times what we do is these lunch and learns and which means we bring lunch and then we hope that the doctors come to their break room and we get a few couple short minutes to talk to them if they're generous enough to give us their time. They don't have to. There's there's no obligation on their part at all to even come or if they do come to even talk to them. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of in the beginning of my career, there was a lot of fear that I have to just keep talking, just, you know, feature dump on them over and over and over because, you know, they could walk away at any point. There's no, there's nothing keeping them here. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so I got in and, uh, you know, I just talk and talk and talk to this doctor and, uh, then another, another doctor, he's a urologist comes over <laughs> and he's like, so, so you guys do sleep apnea, right? Like, yeah. Why are you in my office? And I just froze. You know, I, I was like, well, uh, well, I'm not a doctor, but just stammering and stammering my way through. And to be honest, it was the first urologist office I was in. And I did not have a ton of information going in about the connection between sleep apnea and urology, which you may be surprised to find out. There's actually a ton of connections there. And so I wasn't nearly as, yeah, I wasn't nearly as prepared as I should have been. And, uh, I just felt like a complete chump for about the next week. This is, this is huge wow. in and of itself because there's something to be said. First of all, let's go back a little bit in terms of your history. You were in the restaurant industry or in, in, in that service industry. If you were to say, 
during your time in the service industry in a restaurant, what was the most expensive item you would sell? I mean, not, not in one shot, nothing like we do right now, right. you know, so it, a one, you know, one meal for someone in a really expensive might be 300 bucks. Like we did a deal that was 300, we did a, a meal that was $300 a person. And okay. that, you know, if you take it for one person, that's the most expensive thing sure. you've ever sold. Sure. And then when you go into a doctor's, now you've got the B2B side and the B2C side. So let's just go from the consumer end, the consumer getting a sleep device or sleep appliance, they're spending how much money on it? On it. Again, a lot of factors here, but it's in the thousands, right? You know, right. it's in the low thousands. Mm -hmm. You know, it may not all be coming out of their pocket, yep. but you know, yep. that's where the, the area is. So, so would you would you say that the amount of money would also have an effect in terms of how you feel going into that conversation as the quote unquote trusted advisor? Oh, a hundred percent. I remember the first time I told someone over the phone how much one of these was going to be, and it's you know again it was in the low thousands. I had a little yeah. bit of a like I think it's going to be, you know, <laughs> it right? wasn't smooth that first time because you yeah. know it's, you're telling someone a number that you at the at the time you feel is high. I don't feel it's high. Of course, you, this is this is the whole thing about repetition and putting putting in that time to be able to desensitize ourselves, right? And when emotions go up, intelligence goes down. And so when we go into that space of, hey, I'm about to now discuss something that's not, you know, it's not a forty dollar steak. Now I'm going in with a few thousand bucks. the The difference is, is when you get this urologist who says, "Why are you in my office?" Going at, at it now, if somebody said that to you now, what mm -hmm. would you say? How would you respond? Absolutely. Right off the top of my head. Doc, how many, times, how many patients do you know that have Nocturia? Right mm -hmm. there, which Nocturia is waking up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, which everybody just thinks is normal, right? You know, probably mm -hmm. on this podcast, I would guess two out of the four of us do this, right? Yeah. Uh, it's not, <laughs> you know, it's not normal. So there's a lot of connections that I've learned. Yeah. Since. Okay. That's that's huge. And it's, and again, what I love about that is the, the idea of, Hey, you know what, I'm going to move this conversation forward to eventually show that there's a problem, that there's yeah. a need that we can work together. And that ultimately the referrals that this particular doctor sending over to your doctor is going to be beneficial for everyone creating a win-win. And that keeps the money moving. Right, Ben? I mean, how do you go wrong? hundred percent. And, you know, to take it back one, one step, actually, Joe, what I would do first is I would acknowledge. Yes, you would. And then I would ask the question. <laughs> I got you, well trained. Yeah. Well trained. Nice. Got it. <laughs> uh, so, you know, another thing that we like to do is we like to double down on these stories. So I'm going to take uh, the, the framework that Ben just applied. I'm going to ask you, Joe, uh, can you remember a, a story, a moment where somebody stopped you in your tracks? If not, maybe I can come up with one. So similar like, similar like, to the urologist where he just called him out. Why are you in my office? Have you had an experience yes, like that when telling? Ab absolutely not. And, and it was brutal because I wasn't prepared. Yeah. And uh, I will say that I literally hit the bed. So <laughs> I, yeah. And I, 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 I was, I was in an, I was in an office space and it was, they, they didn't understand why I was there because what I was doing was I was pitching. Mm hmm I'd earned the right. So I'd gone into this. It was, it was in a, um, it was in a physiotherapy space. I was selling exercise equipment and instead of asking them questions and finding mm. out, was there a need? Nope. I just went in, I pulled out brochures and, and he's like, why are you, why are you here? Like, the, I don't need, like, he didn't, he didn't need any of the stuff. Yeah. And, and he didn't because he was using accessories, bands, and, and he was using other things that just didn't make any sense to me at the time. And again, I didn't want to have that experience happen again. Right, Ben? I mean, you have that time where that person stops you in your tracks. The way that I felt at that moment, I felt like I was in the first grade where mm -hmm. the teacher pointed me out and embarrassed me in, in front of everyone. That is exactly how I felt. And it was just two of us in the room. Like, yeah, I, I couldn't have gotten out of that office any faster. It was horrible. And so the lesson that I got out of that was being prepared. And ever since then, and both of you have seen me speak on, on a couple of different times, 
now I'm prepared in the such a, what if ha- what would happen if somebody, if I'm on stage and somebody says, you don't know what you're talking about. Like the, that kind of situation, if you're prepared for it ahead of time, right. And Ben, I would acknowledge that and say, well, Hey, really appreciate you letting me know how you're feeling. I'm just curious. What is it that I said that you don't agree with? And you know, um, this is coming right out and I've said it out loud so many times and I've practiced even, even with my wife, Shauna, where I'm practicing a speech and it's like, Shauna, I just want you to spurt out. You don't know what you're talking about. Like, yeah. Just so that I could be prepared to say that. So that at least in that, that context, I don't have to rely on anything other than muscle memory, which is so important. So how about you, Jeff? Have you had that situation happen where, you know, somebody called you out and uh, in the middle of your tracks? You know, not that I can like specifically remember. I've had those scenarios where I feel like I'm at the principal's office, but it's mainly been like customer service where I'm cleaning up after like somebody a else's company mess. mistake or somebody oh, else's yeah. mistake. Yeah. Um, you know, not to say that I've never made mistakes. Absolutely I have. What what stood out to me was was the other part of that that Ben had talked about, which is the lump in the throat pitching the mm. price. And I can definitely vividly remember the first time I pitched anything over a couple hundred bucks. Uh, it was th- uh, 3360. So it's $3,360 for a personal training plan. And I was pitching it to an elementary school teacher, bless her heart, she she did buy. But I was like, <clears throat> so the total <clears throat> is gonna be <laughs> and like, I just prolonged presentation, I just drew it out i was like okay 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 you can do this in my head i'm just like just say it just say the damn number yeah then i finally just blurted it out it probably just was louder like volume went up or whatever i was like 3360 what do you think about that (laughs) like and she went with it which was awesome which means that i did a good enough job the rest of the time with the appointment that she was you know there or and or she was just one of those 20 percent uh that just buy no matter what you guys know the drill. The the once in a blue moon sale that's easy. It could have been just one of those. I I don't know, uh, but it was one of it was my first big sale ever. Period. Uh, and yeah, it was one of my first dozen or so sales uh, in my sales career. So what did that do to your confidence, Jeff? Oh, I, I was uh, overly confident after that for a little while until I got put back in my place. Uh, so it took. That was a situation where we we would go around and like cold call people at the gym, essentially. Anybody who joined this gym, I'd call them, say, hey, have you done your free personal training assessment? And they'd be like, no, I haven't. Oh, my gosh. Or they'd be like, uh, no, and I don't care. So right. it took a few more of those like leave me alone for me to be like, OK, like you made one sale. Calm down. <laughs> like that's one. One good job. Pat on the back. Move along. Let's help some more people. Uh, and I settled back down to earth <laughs> thanks to gravity. So. Ben, did, have you had that where you 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 get on a roll and you feel your your confidence almost take you to a slightly higher level where it's like I'm being a little cocky now? Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, that resonates with me. Even back when I was younger. So when I was when I was like 19, uh, I did a summer sales job for a pest control company in Northern California. And one day, a buddy and I, uh, Saturday, we're like, "Hey, if we get our quota today." We're going to go out to Oakland and we're just going to have a great time. Nice. So let's just do this as fast as we can. And we both hit our quota by 11 a.m. And so we were like, wow. we're out. And we just felt like, oh, you know, like we're the like we, we're amazing. We hit this quota by 11. Let's get out of here. And then the next week, I think both of us had like our lowest weeks ever. <laughs> it just you know, you know, like morning. reality combat. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's the example of riding that wave. Like you got to ride when it's high. Anybody who ever we call it sandbagging in sales, right? And everybody, everybody who's been in sales for any amount of time knows about sandbagging. Basically, Mm -hmm. you get your quota, right? And it's either in your case, that was like for the week or for the day. Uh, Oftentimes, it's for the month or for the quarter, right? So you hit your sales number for the month and it's the 27th and you're like, ah, I will take the next three days off. And then the next month is trash. And you're like, oh, okay, well, we could have, yeah, could have bought more brownie points with the previous month or the previous quarter. I used to deal with this all the time because I I worked for this giant organization. uh, I I can't name it on the podcast, but it was a big gym organization based out of Chicago. And I worked at their East Coast gyms because they had branched out there. And we had, uh, no kidding, like one to 1.5 million a month in revenue 
that I owed for personal training. Like I had to make sure all my gyms sold enough personal training in that amount that we hit that goal. And our goal was never 100%. That was unacceptable. It was 105, 110, 115, 120. And that's the only Mm. way I got paid a bonus. So I didn't get commission. I just got bonuses. And every single month, we'd be like, how close are we? And it would come down to midnight on the last day of the month. Like we'd be 1158. I'd be like, all right, did we hit it? Did we hit it here? Did we hit it here? And I'd be checking all my gyms. I'd call them up. They'd have to be available. This is like the worst working experience I've ever had in my life. But I'd be at the gym till midnight calling everybody. Did we hit it? As soon as we hit it, I left the gym. I was like, I'm out. Like we're good. Uh. So you'd be waiting for that quota. And then on those rare occasions that were already there, my boss would call me and he'd be like, hey, this other region is down. I need you to overperform this month. And I'd be like, I'm sorry, we we hit our numbers. We need to save it for next month. And he'd be like, you're not sandbagging me. <laughs> it's like, dude, come on. That's, that's my consistency of my paycheck. Of course, I'm sandbagging you. I want to get paid next month, man. <laughs> So, dude, I yeah, that's such an interesting experience that you get really only in like uh, in in sales. Like it's so specific, but it's mm, yeah, same I want to ask you guys about this, actually. Yeah, you guys have both been doing this a long time. What things have you done to kind of ride out? There's just ups and downs in sales. That's just the nature yep. of it. Internally, what things what kind of things have you all done to make that smooth out a little bit for you? So you're not you're not sweating when you know when you're uh, you're a week yeah. out and the the quota is down by twenty five percent. Yeah. So let we'll tell you what we'll wrap up on this uh, and we'll we'll go around. All of us will mention something there. So I I mean I can go first. The uh, for me it was we called it dial for dollars, and essentially you get to a point where it's like okay we don't have a ton of leads uh, on the books right we don't have a ton of appointments you can't sell to an empty chair so you know or or I'm swinging and missing. Right. So I'm like, oh, for five, oh, for 10. Once I was over 12, you know, it happens. And it, in that case, you can wallow in self pity and just, it, which doesn't solve anything. I mean, it makes you feel better for a moment, <laughs> but then you're just like still in the same situation. So the only way to change it, we called dial for dollars, which was pick up the damn phone. We would yell at each other <laughs> to, do, to do this in the office and be like, all right, pick up the phone. And then you just press that first number. And it would be like the country code, right? So one for the States or, or North America, really. So you press one, and you're like, okay, area code. And then you just start dialing those numbers and then you just answer the phone, man. So we would just grab a folder. Uh, we had what we call our dead list, uh, which was anybody who didn't buy in the last 30, 60, 90 or 120 days. And we would go through that list, obviously starting with the most recent and working our way back if we were super desperate. We would call everybody we could. Sometimes 150 people in a day, uh, you did what you had to do. And then if that didn't work, we're also walking the floor. So we would just go, right? So the best thing that I've always recommended to people is not necessarily like that. That's cold calling. Not something I recommend that much anymore, especially with like the the era of cold DMs being the way we think not good. Um, What I generally recommend is just take action, right? Who do you know who? Go to your clients, ask for referrals, go to your content, who's interacting with you, reach out to them, right? So like, if that was, that would have been 2012, 11, right? Somewhere around there. So like, the best thing I could do is call. Facebook was still fairly young, 2007 to 11. Yeah, it was still pretty young. We're not doing like big group stuff in there. That wasn't happening at the time. Um, So you call, you walk around, you talk to people physically. If you're an online person, like it's now reach out to anybody engaging with you. Just just engage back or just take action. Just do something. And that momentum always makes you, one, feel better, but always puts you back into the position to start making sales again. Like it always fixes it. If you just take action, it always fixes it. Um, you know, the better action you take, the faster it fixes it. That's the way I look at it. So that's me. Joe, what about you? So again, to clarify your question, Ben, it's if I find myself in a slump, what am I doing to get out of it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or or just like, how do you mentally deal with that? You know, knowing that it's... So it, action, it I, I'll, I'll resonate with what Jeff would st- has said. Action beats anxiety. So get to work. Because ultimately, just the, the process of doing is going to help. Secondly... Can you analyze what's going on? 
not uncommon for me, especially when I was younger, when I had my retail stores, I would have people listen and or I'd, I'd be listening in to other people's conversation. And then we would huddle and go, okay, what went right? Like we got, if, if somebody got a sale, it's like, okay, what, what went really well there? And then we would repeat it. And then it's like something went wrong. Then you, you have to do auditing of your process at all times. So we would, yes, action beats anxiety and then audit the process. And that also by auditing, you're surrounding yourself by other people that are successful. And all that does is it lifts you up. So that helps you get out of that slump. How about you, Ben? Well, you guys both took it from the action angle. So to just do some, I, I, what both of you said resonates with me as well. I think action does beat anxiety. I think, you know, you got to go do something for sure. I'll just to take it at a different level and also to promote the, uh, the shirt that I have on here. Big thing for me is mindset. And, uh, I listen to some music that really is like gets me pumped up to do stuff. Love it. And yes. that, that can help a lot too. So just changing that mindset around can be huge. Change your state. What's that? Change, change your state. state. Right. Yeah. I mean, we're we're sitting down right now, but you know yeah. that most times I'm standing up. It's a it's a game changer. Yeah. This yeah. Is change a, that energy. Exactly. This is a purposeful state for the podcast because it keeps us a little more chill. Yeah. Because when we used to stand in podcasts, it got out of control, didn't it, Joss? <laughs> Too much. <laughs> we just ramble on way too much. And speaking of rambling on, we've been doing that today. So uh, we'll wrap it up here. Ben, really appreciate your time, man. Thank you so much for being on here. Is there anything that you want to shout out? If anybody wants to find you, talk to you, uh, follow you, We're anything follow you want to recommend there? Yeah, if you want to follow us, you go to Sleep Better ATX on Instagram. Uh, I'm not personally a, a big Instagram or social media person, but for sure. Uh, you can check out Sleep Better Austin, Sleep Better ATX uh, on Instagram for sure. Check us out. Fantastic. Awesome. Again, Thanks appreciate the time, man. And uh, yeah, thanks for everybody who's been watching uh, the show. Uh, we have guests on just about every single week. So if you want to learn more from others on their failures, experiences, and how they've learned and grown from those failures and experiences, then tune back in for the next one. Thanks so much for watching and listening. Chaz, fix out of here. <laughs>